Uh, great to have you all here again, our members of God's royal family. Uh, today we are going to be looking at a story in the Bible from Acts chapter 8. And we will be looking at how knowing Jesus uh, can change your life. Uh, anyway, uh, let's get on with it. A young girl was trying to smooth out the grassy area behind her house so she could play with her toys and plan a picnic. There was a large rock right in the middle of where she wanted to play and it was blocking her from her work. The girl pushed and pushed and she pulled and pulled with all her might. She leant against the rock and even tried to dig around the rock. But no matter how hard she tried, the rock wouldn't budge. It was stuck there. The young girl's father watched on from a distance. After a while, he came to his daughter and said, You need to use all your strength to move a rock this large. The girl answered, I have been trying and trying, and I have not been able to move the rock. I have used all my strength. Putting a hand on his daughter's shoulder, the father gently corrected her. No, you haven't. Sometimes using your greatest strength doesn't seem that strong at all. The small girl was puzzled, but the father continued. You haven't asked for my help yet. Together, they bent down and began to push the rock. With the assistance of her father, the rock moved easily. The area was clear and she could now play and have her picnic. We all face rocks in our lives things that are too big or too much for us to move on our own. Jesus wants us to remember 
that he is more powerful than any rock. He is stronger than any rock. He wants us to rely on him in solving our problems. My name is Zane. And my name is Josiah. It's exciting to see things change, and we're going to do a drawing that will change before your eyes. You need black paper and some colourful chalk. A shape to trace around and some tissues. First, you need to cut out your shape that you want, put it in the middle of your paper, and then stick it down with some blue tape. Now it's time to use the chalk. Create a thick line around your picture. You can change colours as you go. Once you've gone all the way round, it's time to use the tissues. What do we do with the tissues? You get one, and then you scrunch it up. And then you smudge out the lines. When you're done, remove your stencil shape. Blow away the extra chalk. If you want, you can write, God changes me inside your shape. That change is pretty good, but it'll never be as exciting as the change that God put in my life. Knowing that God changes me, it makes me glow inside. Why not you make your own art? Bye! Hi Kings Kids out there, we're here to do a Reader's Theatre. So when you see the words come up on your screen, read along with us. I've also got my uh, Kings Kids friends here. Are you ready kids? Yes! Can I tell you something? Sure, of course you can. It's something special. Great, let's hear it. It's something that could change your lives. For the better or for the worse? Oh, definitely for the better. Then tell us. Come on. All you have to do is ask. What is that it? That doesn't make any sense. How does that change my life? I guess it depends who you are asking and what you're asking, doesn't it? Hmm. Well, if you asked a chair for a drink, it wouldn't help much, would it? Not really. Or if you asked a bus driver for a plane ride, that wouldn't work either, would it? No. And what about if you asked a doctor to build your house? That's not going to help either. But you said this thing that could change our life was for the better. Ah, what if you could ask someone whatever you wanted, whenever you needed, knowing that they would always respond and give you what you need? Sounds pretty good to me. Me too. So what's the catch? All you have to do is ask, but you have to ask the right person. And who is that? The person who has changed my life. Keep going. Jesus. Knowing Jesus changed my life. 
So Jesus is the person we need to ask? Yes! And when we ask, he will give us everything we want, right? No. Huh? huh? When we ask, he will give us everything we need. Not necessarily want, you see? Jesus changes our lives because he is a good listener. But he is also a good planner and he knows the beginning from the end of all of our lives. He listens to our challenges and joys and gives us what we need. And that changes our lives? Yes! Hmm. Knowing Jesus changes our lives. For the good, for the better. And all we have to do is ask and he'll give us what we need. And hopefully some of what we want to. Now you're getting it. Knowing Jesus changes our lives. We just have to act on knowing him. And we have to ask for... His power. His wisdom. His knowledge. His guidance. And his love in our lives. All we have to do is... Ask! And he can give us great things like... Love. Joy. Peace. Patience. Kindness. Goodness. Gentleness and self-control. Wisdom to make the right choices. And comfort when we are sad or lonely. Doesn't that sound life-changing? All we have to do is ask. ask! And it will change your lives. Hello, King's Kids. Thanks for being at my workshop today. I'm Grandpa John. I really enjoy spending time out here where I can make things and be reminded of the master carpenter, Jesus, who also used to make things in a workshop. I always keep my favorite book, the Bible, right here on my workbench where I can read its wonderful stories. I have another great story for you today too, King's Kids. Are you ready? Philip loved Jesus and wanted everyone else to know and follow Jesus too. Philip was filled with the Holy Spirit and he went to the city of Samaria to share Jesus' message. Crowds of people came to hear Philip speak. They watched in amazement as sick people were made well and the paralyzed and lame were healed. The city of Samaria was full of great joy. In this same city, there was a man named Simon. Simon liked to trick people using sorcery from the devil. He'd like to tell people how powerful he was, using trickery to deceive them. You know, many people followed Simon because he had amazed them for such a long time. When Philip came to Samaria and was teaching the good news and the kingdom of God, many were baptized. Simon was also amazed at the great signs and miracles that he saw Philip through the power of the Holy Spirit perform. So Simon too was baptized. Peter and John heard about what was happening in Samaria. So they came to help Philip with all the new believers. Even though the new believers had been baptized, they had not yet received the gift of the Holy Spirit. It was the Holy Spirit's power that had enabled Philip to preach so powerfully and perform all the signs and wonders in Jesus' name. The disciples gathered the new believers together laid hands on them and prayed that they would be filled with the Holy Spirit so they too would have the power to go and spread the message of Jesus' love. Simon saw this happening. He wanted to have this power too. Simon approached the disciples with bags of money and said, Give me also this ability so that Everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Well, Peter answered him, May your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money? 
You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. The gift of the Holy Spirit is not something that can be bought with money. It is a free gift that God gives to those who earnestly seek him, to those who want to share the message of Jesus' love with others. It is a free gift that we can ask God for today. Jesus wants to give us the power of the Holy Spirit so we too can help share his message of love with the world. Why don't you talk to Jesus about this today? Today's Bible verse comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. Hi everyone, my name is Nurse Betty. One of the things I love to do is to teach boys and girls how to stay healthy. Today, I'd like to talk with you about positive thinking. Positive thinking is being able to look at the good in situations. Another word for this is being optimistic. There is a strong link between being positive and being healthy. So, you can try to be happy even when you don't have a lot. You can have a good time even if you're losing in a game. You can be happy when someone else does well. Here are a few tips to help you to be positive in your thinking. 1. Focus on the good things that are happening around you. 2. Start a gratitude journal. Write down the things you are thankful for. 3. Get enough sleep. 4. Choose your feelings. 5. Do what you can to help others. The way you think about yourself does have an impact on your body. So think about all the good things that are happening around you. This does not mean that you ignore the bad things that happen because things don't always turn out the way you always want or expect, but always try to see the good that you can in your situation. There is a verse in the Bible, Philippians 4 verse 8, which gives us the best advice of all on how to stay positive. 
Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. King's kids, remember that Jesus loves you. Take care of your body and take care of each other. Hey, get out of here, Andy. It's time to log in to study another Bible text. Oh, that sounds great, Shane. Hey, today we have King's kid, Millie, with us. Hi, Millie. Hi. How you going, Millie? It's really good to have you here. But before we start, how about we pray? Dear God, please guide us. Thank you. Hey, Andy, uh, where's, where's our text from today? Oh, well, Shane, today our text comes from 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Millie, would you like to read your verse first? Sure. Anyone who believes in Christ is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. That's interesting. I wonder what my uh, grandma's Bible says. I'll read it. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Hey, hey Andy, can you read your version? I can do that, Shane. If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. Hmm, interesting. Hey Millie, what do you think it might mean to be a new creation? I think what it means to be a new creation is that, like, you thought this was a thing and then you talk to a friend and stuff and then you realise that it's something new that you didn't know before. So that's something new created in your mind. Oh, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that's a new creation, isn't it, Andy? It sure is. I also think it could mean that when you know Jesus, you want to be more like him and leave your old self behind. Yeah. Hey, hey Millie. Yeah? Do you have a question for uh, either me or, or Andy? I have a question for both of you. Ooh, okay. What do you think has God created for you that's new in your life? Mmm, that's an interesting question. Well, he created King's Kids. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What about you, Andy? Oh, well, Millie, he has given me lots of great things to look at in nature that remind me that he loves me. So what do you think, Millie? Well, you know, when you look at two people, um, one of them doesn't have Jesus in the heart and the other one has Jesus in their heart. I think what I see with the one that has Jesus in their heart is that they can be or they are helpful, they like help people around, they tell people about Jesus, they go to church, yeah. Yeah, well that, that's really cool. So they're just happy people. Yeah, I, I want to be like that. Do you want to be like that, Andy? Oh, I want to be like that, Shane. I want everybody to know that Jesus is in my heart. Hey Andy, do you want to pray to uh, before we go? Oh, I can do that. Dear God, Thank you for your word. Help us to follow you. Amen. 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 Well, it's time to go now. We'll see you all later. See you, Andy. See you, Millie. Bye. Bye, King's Kids.
Ah, what a great prayer to pray uh, to Jesus uh, to help our lives to be a reflection of Him. Uh, Kings kids, uh, why don't you ask Jesus right now to change your life and change it for the better. All you have to do is ask. Uh, He is waiting right now for you to talk to Him. Uh, Anyway, Kings kids, uh, it's time to go now. I will look forward to catching up with all of you again next time. Uh, So take care. Uh, Stay safe and God bless. So I will sing the song Cause I know that I belong To the King of the universe He gives me peace that passeth All understanding The joy that overflows Isn't it just totally amazing The love that my Father shows I'm a King's kid Yes, I'm a King's kid My Father is the King of the reverie Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to Hashtag We Are The Church, the South Pacific Division news and information about what God is doing in our division. And uh, you're going to be really blessed. There's so many stories that have incredible impact. Now, usually you see me with other people and Unfortunately, because of the COVID lockdown in Sydney, that's not going to happen. Uh, I was to have mums at the table, Fiona, with us, but um, she's in a local government area. They're not allowed to travel at all. So it'll just be be me. But it won't just be me because for prayer, we've got Mele Viahola from Trans-Pacific Union Mission, who's the education director there. We have also for our devotional minister, uh, Matthew Walter, who is the Central Papuan Conference Youth Director. And we have great music from Samoa. And to end off the session, we're going to have the impact of Adventist education and Warunga Adventist school students. Sit back, relax. You're going to really enjoy this.
Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all the praises and honor and glory for what you have done in our life. And before we begin this program, we humbly invite your presence, your leading in this program, so that those who are listening will be encouraged, bring hope to them during this difficult time. We thank you, Lord, for how you have led your work in this division. And it is our humble prayer that you will continue to help us um, to be a vibrant Adventist movement, living our hope in Jesus and transforming the Pacific. In Jesus' name, amen. I am very excited to share with you a special faith sharing testimony with you all today. The scripture that I want to share with us today is found in the book of Titus chapter 1 and verse 4. This is how it reads. To Titus, a true son in our common faith. Grace, mercy, and peace from God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. The question that I want to ask every one of us today, according to this passage, is, Are you a true son in the faith that is in Christ Jesus? If Jesus is going to come today, will he find you a true son in the faith? We are truly living in a most interesting and challenging times. With these lockdowns that we are experiencing, it has challenged how we are doing discipleship. But I want to praise God today that this has not been the case for us here in Central Power Conference. God has blessed the church here in Central Power Conference and we have seen a lot of lives, a lot of people who have given their lives to Jesus and they have gone through water baptism. And 
I want to say that I want to also say that God has truly blessed the church here in Central Papua Conference. And today, as you will see some of the highlights that the Central Papua Conference we have been involving, we want to make sure that every member of the church here in Central Papua Conference, we must truly become a true son in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. We want to become a disciple of Jesus, reaching out to those around us, and we want to introduce them to Jesus. And when we introduce them to Jesus, they will make their own decision and choices to accept Jesus and give their lives to Jesus. This is a real blessing. This ministry is a real blessing. And uh, this Bible study uh, kind of put me back on the path, looking back into the life of Jesus. And this is the main character nowadays for us to get through to, to know God and be with God and to go further into uh, to the, to the future, the way God wants us to go through. Yeah. So I really enjoyed it. And I'm looking forward to help strengthen this man ministry in a way that uh, my capability can take me through. I want to challenge every one of you. If you are not involving actively in discipleship, now is the time we all must involve in discipleship because this is the great commission that Christ has given to all of us. And that great gospel commission is found in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 to 20. Go and make disciples. And I believe that now is the time for us as a church, we have to go and we have to make disciples for Jesus before Jesus will come back to take his children home. So once again, my question to you is, are you a true son in the faith that is in Christ Jesus? And if you are a true son in the faith, you will raise your hands and you will say, and I want to inform in disciples. May God will bless every one of us as we continue to involve ourselves in making disciples, preparing lives for this life and also for the life that is to come. Thank you and may God bless you all. Jesus means to me that he's a Best friend. He's my friend. My friend. Someone that you can always depend on. Savior. He is very strong. Jesus is the center of my life. It's nice to know you have someone that knows everything about you. I can have I have someone to trust. He's a companionship that like will never hurt you. Our main connection to God. Like every day he leaves me in awe and wonder. It's a helper. He he helps me, he picks me up and you know. It also makes me look forward to Saturdays, fellowship and whatnot. Um, it feels really comforting to like know that like he's always there no matter what, like through the thick and the thin. Like it makes me feel amazed. I know that someone's taking care of me. You can always depend on him, yeah. You can really trust in who will always look after you. He's the one I praise. I can be forgiven every day. Like it's it's an amazing thing. He's always there for me, and when I'm struggling in life, I can always ask him for help. <laughs> Wasn't it great to see the focus of Adventist education being Jesus and that the students get it? And I know that's the case all over the division because all that we do should be about making disciples for Jesus. That's been our focus in the division discipleship and disciple making. And I'm holding in my hand two of the greatest tools that you will find around our division, the World Changer Bibles and the Discovery Bible Reading Guides. And there have literally been hundreds of thousands of these distributed all around our division. And I can take you just about anywhere and people will know the impact of getting people together in groups 
and reading the Bible together, discussing it together and seeing life change because the Holy Spirit uses the power of the message of Jesus. We're going to go to places like Dubbo with Pastor Jay and also to Eunice in, in Cairns. We're going to see education and the school's Bible reading project. And then finally, we'll see Pastor Wayne Baum crossing via Zoom to Pastor Enric in Vanuatu and hearing what is happening there. God changes lives through the scriptures because the written word reveals the living word and Jesus, the living word, changes lives. Dubbo is basically the, the central hub of the West. It's the roundabout where everyone usually passes by. My wife, she's, um, oh, she's the best. What I love about her, she has a big heart for people. When I first came to Dubbo, the moment I was welcomed at the door, I started to fall in love with the church. When I got to meet them, I got to understand them. And as they continue to share the story with me, oh, I just love their vulnerability. I love their honesty. It's just really, really helped me grow a, a close bond with this church. This group we're called the Back to Back Brotherhood. I was introduced to, to, to these two young islanders here in town, I uh, came straight from NZ. And, you know, we started talking and I said to them, hey, you know, what are you guys thoughts about starting up a Bible study group? And they said, yeah, hey, that'd be great. You know, I asked them, do you guys have a Bible? And they said, no, we don't have a Bible. Well, hey, I'll bring a Bible for you guys next Bible study. And you know the Bible that I brought them? Well, it was a World Changes Bible. After one week, they invited another friend. We've had so many guys come through this group and I give them all a Bible. And now we journey as a brotherhood together. Oh, this kid, man. It's a huge transformation. He said to me, you know, Jay, I came to Australia just to party hard and to play rugby. I never thought in my life I would be part of a Bible study group. So um, I met Jay when I first came to Dubbo. Um, I was at a pub once and the security guard at the pub, he was a Samoan bloke. And he goes to me, oh man, there's one, there's one guy I want to introduce you to. And I was like, who's that? He's like, a guy named Jay, he's a pastor. He came off Jay to my house. And I met Jay, you know, really energetic, really welcoming, really happy. I told myself, I want to start surrounding myself with the right people. Jay wanted to start up a little group called um, Back to Back Brotherhood. It's all about like, having a closer relationship with God. It's been over a year now since we've um, been hanging around with these boys. It started off with three of us. Now, there's a lot of lives changed. Earlier this year, I was part of the group that went to Converge, to the camp, my first ever church camp I've been to, and it was just amazing. It, like, I never had that experience before. God is just, He's just transforming lives not just in these boys, but also through them and influencing those around them. And those around them are now asking, hey, what's the difference? What's the change here? You know, this group is like, I'm home away from home. I wanna go out there and help someone else's life. Be a leader out in the community. Be a leader out wherever God takes me next. I realized that my students were not doing well, so I decided to use the Bible to see if that can make a difference. We decided to ask schools to have at least 30 minutes in the timetable for students to read and summarize. And it did wonders for my students. 
At first, I didn't know how to spell words and did my Bible summary, and then I started improving in my handwriting and in my spelling of words. And as they start reading the Bible, they, they develop the attitude, the behavior in three years. From 21 out of 21 schools to four out of 24 schools in the province. My attitude changed towards them and one day they told me that, oh, you changed from your behavior, Sam, that's really good. And I'm like, really? And they said, yeah, that's good. And I'm like, oh, thank you. I think it's because of the Bible summary and because God changed me. So I'm thankful that God sent some people to give us Bible summary to do it in our school. It has helped me to dig deeper into the Word of God. Helped me to study the Word even better than I was before I was introduced to the Bible summary. When I started asking those WH questions, it began to open up the Bible to me. It was like a treasure that I had to dig up out from the ground. And it, I began exploring things that I never knew were in the Bible. We decided to go to the rest of the country where we introduced it to all our Adventist high schools. And maybe I should add that the government schools have also picked up on that. We're also sharing that with the government schools with the same results. I think the most exciting part of this is the fact that we found that it also helped change behaviors. And when you see students walking into the water of baptism, that's an exciting thing we don't want to miss. My name's Eunice, and I hail from Papua New Guinea. And I've been living in Australia for 35 years now. But while I was in New Guinea, I met this wonderful man, Peter, and we have three children and nine grandchildren. I was very active in the church, and I realized after three years that I needed more to life than what I was going through. I was called to do a literature ministry, which means that I went from door to door selling Christian literature. Then I felt a calling to the households of faith. What I mean by households of faith is that we are doing church in the home. In our discovery Bible readings, our group found that we were able to have open and honest discussions, ask questions, and try to find the answers from what we were reading. And you didn't have to have a Bible knowledge or spend so many years in the church in order to participate in a discussion. I didn't go to church. Yeah, it wasn't something that was really part of my lifestyle. My background is Catholic and then decided to leave the church when I left home and more or less have said no to all religion. Up until I met up with Eunice, she was telling me about the, her household of faith that she was holding at her home. I brought John along with me and it was very different to what I expected. And I felt very comfortable in her home and the way that they conducted it, it was nice. And there's a lot of teaching and learning within the stories and morals. That's what I'm interested in. There's got a lot of good learning there. I started looking for God a few years ago. I was searching everywhere for the right church. I found Seventh-day Adventist Church, and then I reached out to Eunice, and then she invited me to the home group church. Yeah, it's been amazing. <laughs> amazing for my spiritual growth. Rochelle is my niece. She's very responsible, very reliable, and has a real deep passion for the Word of God. Households of Faith to me at first was a really awesome idea. I wanted to have connection with people. Yeah, getting deep into the Word. But I also wanted to be able to make friends and make really feel like I was part of a family. Doing life on your own is too hard today. But doing life with a group who supports you and who prays for you is just wonderful. It 
it's worth anything. It's worth all the hard work. It's worth all the preparation. It's worth every bit of effort that I put into it. I'm really looking forward to that time when I can open my home up to others because I want to be able to see the change in how <laughs> I want to be a witness to see how Jesus changes people's lives. He's done for me. From Bible Discovery Reading in Cairns, I'm going to take you across to Vanuatu and explore with Pastor Andrew what they've been doing during lockdown in Vanuatu. Pastor Andrew, great to see you again. Last time we were together is, was in January 2020, just prior to lockdown when we conducted some training together. And from there, the young people were really equipped for mission. They were given Bibles, um, 8,000 of them. But really what happened then when Vanuatu went into lockdown? What did the mission do in order to take the gospel forward? Thank you too much, uh, Pastor Wayne. In responding uh, to the lockdown, uh, the mission discipleship team distributed Bibles to every districts, churches, church members, and because we're no longer able to organize public evangelistic meeting, we divided uh, church members into small groups. So there are around 246 plus small groups where they gather together, just work family to family with their interest and in, uh, uh, sharing God's word during the July harvest evangelistic uh, meeting program. So they were just really reading the Bible together in small groups. Now you've got your, some Bible discovery reading guides there, but there was one man in particular Keith. Now, Keith was a custom man. Tell us the story of Keith and what custom man actually means. Custom meaning that uh, his previous life, he was deeply involved in uh, witchcraft and traditional practices. So he got baptized in 2019. He was really eager with Bible study. So he wanted to attend a Lehman Seminary. Unfortunately, due to COVID-19, he was not able to attend a layman seminary. So he came to the discipleship training that happened uh, at his district, Torpa district. So he received those simple resources, the Bible reading discovery, World Changes Bible. He went back to his village and there he shared God's word with his relatives, his sisters, brothers, aunties and uncle. He got eight of the members of his families baptized and he planted the church in his village, Koro Gawa Island in the Torba province of Anuatu. So extraordinary things happening there. Um, a custom man who wasn't um, used to Bible reading or reading the Bible at all through Bible discovery reading understood and began to learn who Jesus was. That transformed his life. And then he took that message then out to transform other people. What an amazing story. So Pastor Andrew, we're just so grateful for sharing that story. We're so grateful too for your ministry and that of the, the other pastors and, and lay people in Vanuatu for taking the gospel to the world or to Vanuatu in such difficult times. May God continue to bless you and the team in Vanuatu. Thank you so much. And we're wishing God's blessing to all church family members to the uh, SPD and as well as uh, abroad. God bless. Thank you, Pastor.
My name is Brian Solomon. I worked as a district director and pastor in Isabel Island, one of the longest islands in the Solomons. Approximately about 80% of the total population is dominated by members of the Church of Melanesian, the Anglican Church, while the other 20% comprises of other Christian denominations including the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Currently, Isabel District has only three organized churches and very few new church plants. The growth of Adventist Church in this island is very slow. Therefore, one of our main aim in the district is to plant new churches so that as to extend our presence in the North Adventist villages. So what we did was we began by praying and asking God to open doors in the North Adventist villages so that we can share with them the message of hope and love. Surely God did answer our prayers. Let me share with you how God answers our prayer in one of our experiences. It was on a beautiful Wednesday morning, 5th of May, 2001, our 11-man team consisting of laymen, elders, and youth volunteers who have the passion to serve God in the beautiful island of Isabel left Buala, that's our main station, at 10 o'clock in the morning on our way to Kia, Kupikolo, and Ritamala on the tip of the island as part of our pastoral visitation in Isabel district. The journey would take us six hours by outboard motor, and I could see as we traveled the delight and happiness expressed by my team members. There was laughter and there was excitement echoed as the journey begins. Along the way, others were shouting, Isabel, for Jesus, I will go. You know, the sea was really calm and it was a beautiful day. However, Three hours into our journey, the weather changes. Dark clouds were building up on the horizon. Strong winds began to blow and it began to rain. Not long, it was raining so heavily that we could not see the nearest island. It was really cold as well. Suddenly, uninviting waves came splashing into our boat. So we put on our life jackets and jackets and we jumped out of the boat. You know, we drifted for an hour and finally we reached the mangrove source. The weather was so bad, there were high swirls, dark clouds and heavy rain. So we decided to take shelter on the nearest village. It took us about 30 minutes to reach the nearest village named Toilego. This village is dominated by members of the Anglican Church of Melanesian. However, upon our arrival, the people in the village gladly welcomed us and asked us if we could stay in the village for the night. We accepted their request and took shelter in their community rest house. They brought us food and provided for us beddings for the night. We really enjoyed our stay in that village. While we were still in the house, the community leader came and reported to us that the village chief and all the people in the community wanted to talk, to, to talk with us in that community hall at 7 o'clock in the night. Upon hearing that, we got ourselves prepared and at 7 o'clock in the night, we went to the community hall. Not long, the pews in the community hall was filled with children and people in the community. The head chief in the community then stood up and welcomed my team into their village. In his opening remarks, he said, it is not a mistake you came to my village today. We believe that God has led you to us. For so long we have been planning, praying to meet with the Adventist leaders, but it has never happened. We want you to help us establish our clinic, a clinic in our village. And he continues on and he said, Many lives were lost on their way to the nearest clinic that is approximately two hours travel by our Bermoto. And with tears in his eyes, he continued, We believed that the Adventists have the solution to our problems. From now on, you are welcomed into my village. You know, we thank God that he answers our prayers. We have been praying that God will open up doors in non-Adventist villages so that we can reach them with the message of hope and love. And today, Toilego Village is open up for Adventists to go into the village and share with them 
programs, conduct programs, and the message of hope, as well as they want us to establish clinic and clinic, a clinic in their village. Please pray for us and pray for the work of God to continue on as we share His love in the beautiful island of Isabel. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Brian, for sharing that uh, great story of how God opened up work in another place of Isabel in the Solomon Islands. Your story reminds me of a time in a similar banana boat in the Solomon Islands, but in another area in the open sea and having a storm come up where the waves became much bigger, the wind and the rain. But thankfully, we didn't have to uh, get out of the boat or anything like that. God was good to us. But these things always happen for a reason. And thank you for your ministry. We're now going to turn to our focus on health because good disciples are healthy people. And uh, we're going to see the great work that George Kwong in Fiji is doing as the Trans-Pacific Union Mission Health Director. And then going to Melbourne, uh, to Melbourne City Church and seeing what their Live More project has done. And finally, to New Zealand in Christchurch where Wayne... Pastor Wayne Baum via Zoom again will be talking to Pastor Fafatai Matai and sharing about some great health initiative happening there. We are facing a crisis with lifestyle diseases in the South Pacific. Type 2 diabetes is an entirely preventable but is contributing to 80% of deaths. Every 20 minutes, a limb is amputated. So we've launched the 10,000 Toes campaign with ADRA, enabling churches to become health centers and help with diagnosis and prevention. In Fiji, PNG, and Solomon Islands, the government has asked the Adventist Church to partner in this health initiative. We've even run cheap programs in resorts, and their chefs have requested our vegetarian recipes. The medical missionary work is a door opener. It breaks down prejudices with other people. And a good example is one such village. This is a big village. And uh, years ago, the members of our church wanted to build a church on the side of the village, but uh, we were not allowed to. We were actually virtually chased to go outside of the village. So the church was built about three miles from this village. And during the outbreak of these NCDs, non-communicable diseases, people in the village started to get sick with uh, diabetes, with uh, obesity, with uh, heart problems. The chief of the village himself and the wife had some health issues. So the very first people that they could turn to because they've heard about the Seventh-day Adventists going into villages doing health assessments and the various wellness centers that are helping out in their various villages. So they invited our health team to come into the village. We were given a whole hall where we could do health assessments. We were invited into his house. We got their their, their blood sugars and their blood readings done. and They were so happy that they have offered their village to be to become a health promoting village where we now have two health workers working full time in the village and uh, going house to house, helping people out that are sick and people that need help. The Live More Happy program was really great, um, a program that I participated in. It was really great. We had members of the church also participate and um, people also invited their friends in the, from the community to, to join in. So it was really an, a really encouraging uh, program. Um, we had the opportunity to get out, make sure we could see the sunrise in the morning or the sunset in the evening. We had the phrase, uh, blue and green must be seen. So each one of us was sending you know, text messages, photos of what they've pictures that they've taken and it made each one of us get out, be more active, enjoy, uh, take time to enjoy um, the scenery or the surrounds, 
others were going to their lakes or their rivers. So it was really, really um, great. We had an opportunity uh, fortnightly to meet and uh, talk and see, um, share views of what everyone did. So that was really nice. Um, the other thing we also did was at the end of the session, we had an opportunity, because I really enjoy the program, get uh, the participants to come into my town and um, we had a dinner to celebrate completion of the program. There was, this was also really great because we had members who are not, um, uh, members of the community who are not uh, from the church also participate. We really enjoyed it and we decided we have to run this program again, um, at least this year, you know, or even next year so that we can um, get that opportunity to again go through the program because we really, really learned a lot from, from the program, looking at what we eat, how we participate in the community, exercising. So it was really nice. And I think one of the biggest thing that also came out of it is that we had members who are not um, from the community, who are not uh, in the church also um, joining and are now integrating into the church. One of the biggest thing is um, having running it again, we want to invite more people from the community to participate in the program so that they can also integrate into our church community. So I'm looking forward to that and I hope I can again do it um, uh, next year or hopefully this year if we're able to run the program. So it was a very valuable program. I'd highly recommend it. Right, thank you, Ruth. What a great story to come out of Victoria. Now we go from Melbourne now across to Christchurch and I'm joined now with Pastor Faftai, who's the pastor of the Addington Seventh-day Adventist Church, and also Paletti, one of the church members there. Faftai, great to see you again. This year has been an extraordinary year. You know, with lockdown, the church has had to, I guess, pivot and do different things. Coming out of lockdown, what has your church done in New Zealand? Uh, we, we came out of lockdown and uh, we applied for funding from the government for recovery from COVID-19. And we got the funding and we decided to run a... Um, complete health improvement program, a cheap program for 13 weeks uh, to get the church involved in it. Now, one of the exciting things about the CHIP program, I guess, was when people start, they come in um, concerned about their blood pressure or their blood sugars or their weight. The total weight of all the people combined there was over 3,000 kilos. Now, how many of those 3,000 kilos was lost as a result of the CHIP program? Yeah, we started with a total kilos of 3,860 for 43 people. And at the end of the program, uh, we lost a total of 816 kilos among those 40, 43 people. So that's extraordinary. Yes, yes. Average about 15 to 18 kilos per, per person that was, that was lost. Yeah. yeah, fantastic. So there'll be a lot of happy Samoans now over in New Zealand. Now, you've got Paletti there as well. Tell us about how the CHIP program impacted Paletti. Uh well, it's an amazing story. I mean, he he's a, a, a diabetes patient for over 15 years, but he started with his sugar level at 23, then it came down to 12. The last measurement that he had at the end of the CHIP program was 5.8. He used to take medication, 12 tablets in the morning, 12 tablets in the evening. At the moment, he's not taking anything anymore. The doctors are shocked. Yeah. Fantastic. So that's just simply following a plant-based lifestyle. Correct. Yes, a plant-based diet. Now from here, the impact is spreading out to the rest of the community to a, tell us about the, the university and it's the, the impact of the CHIP program now on other churches. Yes, I'm a part of the uh, Samoan uh, uh, churches uh, fraternity here in Christchurch. And uh, I have discussed it with them and they're interested to, to run a CHIP program in their churches as well. And in October this year, the Otako University is using our church group as a research project into um, a plant-based diet, which they will supply us the diet for the food and they'll take measurements for another 12 weeks for our church. So we'll do that in October towards the end of this year. Fantastic. So the, the CHIP program, what started off coming out of lockdown helping the local church has now gone on to uh, gives impact other churches and also the university. So that's a great story. So thank you and our, um, give our, our richest blessings to the, the church there at Addington. And um, may, as you go into the next, next CHIP program, again, you see extraordinary results. Glenn, it's back to you. Well, congratulations to all of those people in Christchurch who have lost weight and have feeling much more energetic and engaged with life because of the CHIP program. 
well done to you. Health is important and uh, it's great to see your leading example. Another way that we make disciples is by sharing media and books. And we're focusing on Faith FM in Australia and Hope Radio throughout the Pacific. And my friend Tarakate, who's also on the Division Executive Committee and uh, his work in radio there, and uh, Hope Channel, uh, the television as well. But our first story is from Daniel, a 10-year-old whose dad, Brenton Lowe, leads literature ministry for all of the division. And they'll share their experience going door to door, sharing books. I was nervous and excited at the same time. I was nervous because I didn't know what to say or expect, but I was excited because I wanted to share books about hope with people. Some people just said thanks, took a book and went back inside. Other people said no thank you. We were late for meeting back up at church, but we decided to do just one more house. The lady at the house was very excited to see us. Her and Dad and our friend Marty started talking about life. And she told us that one day her car went to get fixed and came back with a radio change to Faith FM. Then her home radio miraculously changed to Faith FM too. She is now listening to Faith FM and wants to go to an Adventist church. But she's shy because she doesn't know anyone at church. So we invited her to come to church and also told her about a ladies group. She was very happy to take a book from us and she has come to church since then too. When this happened it made me feel happy that our influence brought another person to come to church. Hello, my name's Lyle Southwell. I'm one of the hosts on Faith FM Breakfast Show. We broadcast out of Newcastle with The Breakfast Show. And I'm here with Pastor Justin Tarosian, who is one of our local pastors here. We want to share with you some of the experiences and stories about Faith FM Radio. On Faith FM Radio, we reach about 20,000 people each morning on The Breakfast Show. That's exciting because that makes Faith FM Radio Australia's largest church. And most of those are people not of our faith. And so we get to reach out to them and to present Jesus to them every day. Recently, we hit some new records on Faith FM Radio. They were very exciting. We hit 28,000, then we hit 34,000. The next day, we hit 38,000 listeners just on The Breakfast Show. That's super exciting. But what is most exciting is when we hear the stories of people being affected by the broadcast. Of course, we don't often hear those stories because they're right across Australia. But Pastor Justin Tarosian, well, he's just down the road, and so he has some stories that he can share. Now, Pastor Justin, I just wanted to share this one email that I got here because I understand that you bumped into this person, you know this person. Yes. Uh, this is a reply so. from a listener. It says, I am only a very, very new to Christianity, and I want to share how much I enjoy listening to Faith FM. And it was really... And it has really helped undo some of my previous uneducated assumptions and judgments of Christianity. I listen when I'm in the car and I would just keep driving around regardless of my desired destination because I am so often I'm often so enthralled and inspired by the content. I have never thought this is what I would be saying even a few months ago. You could help me by advising me on where to go from here, who to go talk to. I have kind of just been finding my way with your station, online sources, and slowly reading the Bible. Now, Justin, you met this lady. Yes. Can you tell did. us a little bit more of the story? Pick Absolutely. Up so I got an email from Yuli at Faith FM who said this lady has reached out and requested a free book offer and was Steps to Christ. So Yuli and the Faith FM team, as they do, they, they sent the book to us at Hamilton. And uh, my wife, Sharissa, and I actually took it by her home. Uh, we connected with her, and long story short, that was uh, in April, end of April. We'll call her Tina. Tina, since then, has uh, attended a special events where um, Greg Fernandes from up north shared his testimony. She's very interested in hearing testimonies of what God has done in people's lives. And uh, she came for that. She's um, come for ch uh, to church a number of times, Sabbath school and church. And now we are studying the Bible together. She shared with us that even just up until a year ago, she was into the New Age very heavily. 
and never thought that she would become a Christian. But if it wasn't for Faith FM, who knows where she would be. An additional interesting bit of information, Tina, we'll call her uh, for the sake of privacy, she lives literally a stone's throw away from her church and ev from our church at Hamilton. And every time we drive to church, we drive right past her place and say a prayer for her. Hello and Maori from Kiribati. My name is Tarata Kengroy and I, I am the speaker director for Adventist Soap Radio here in the small island nation of Kiribati. We began a 24-hour service since the inauguration in December 16, 2018, serving more than half the Kiribati population living in the capital island of Tarawa and other Kiribati listeners outside of Kiribati via internet streaming. And we want to praise the Lord for his leading that only after our first year in business, he has really blessed the work that we yielded very good results. Being the first radio station in the country to offer a 24-hour service gives us a competitive advantage. And in our second year, we became the most tuned-in radio station in the country. And we began to receive very interesting and positive reports from listeners across the capital. One of them is a powerful Pentecostal preacher and former leader of the Kiribati National Assembly of God, Reverend Elia Mare. This guy paid us a visit and because he could not walk, he parked his car close to the mission door and asked if I could visit him in his car. And I did go out and meet this guy and this is what he said to me. You are doing a great job. Please know that I am one of your keen listeners. I love all the Bible study presentations, everything, and the special 777 prayer. Please, can you pray for me? But this was just one story out of many other good stories that happened because of God's power working with Hope Radio. According to our earlier report to Adventist Record, we related the story by one of our SDA members who usually drives the head of state, President Tanis Mamo, and how the president enjoyed listening to our health program on his car on his way to the airport. In an opening address to the last Kiribati SDA mission session delegates, His Excellency President Tanis Mamo confirmed to the church that he was a keen listener to Op Radio and he enjoyed all the Bible-based programs. President Mamo is not only a talker but also a doer of his words. He took very seriously the health message and the chief program promoted on OP Radio. The Gripus leader had diabetic problems, and together with the First Lady, Madame Tiran, who also wanted to lose some weight, they both decided to take the chief program. And so they sent in their request to our mission office, inviting our wellness center director to come to the state house and administer to them the chief program. And with, within two weeks of their change of diet, exercise, and drinking water and non issues, they already felt a change and better health and wanted to continue on. This happened because of the power of the old message that was presented over OP Radio. July 12, this tiny nation celebrated its 42nd year of anniversary, and for the first time in history, the Adventist women have been asked to prepare vegetarian dishes as part of the state banquet big table. This arrangement was made all by the First Lady, Madam Tedan. On December 16th this year, we will be celebrating our third year in operation, and God has been so good. A number of families have been baptized into the Seventh-day Adventist Church as a, re a result of this radio ministry. And apart from that, many backslider backsliders have come back to church. Unfortunately, OP Radio was down last March due to transmission issues, now awaiting spare parts. Although this seems to be a great blow to the ministry, but on the other hand, it is a blessing in disguise. We can only praise the Lord that there are listeners who have decided to come into the Adventist Church after learning that OP Radio had a problem. One of them is this man who I had the privilege of meeting him when I took his divine service at the Bikinibu SDA Church. And this is what he said to me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Your Bible studies and prophecy series, I have found the truth I've been looking for. I wanted to hear more, but since your radio is down, I decided to come to your church and see the truth for myself. 
And there are many more and more stories of how God has used this radio ministry in reaching people of all faiths, regardless of hatred or opposition from leaders of these churches. Friends, there are still many out there who want to learn more. So our Bible team are still busy doing Bible studies right now across the Capitol Tower in preparation for this July harvest. Please remember them. And please remember this Island Hope ministry in your prayers and support. To God be the glory. All across New Zealand, God is using Hope Channel to reach people's hearts to inspire a desire for a better relationship with Christ and have a new life with Him. This is Kevin and Anita's story. Anita Kelsall was going to a Sunday church, but she wasn't satisfied because her partner, Kevin, wouldn't come. It felt lonely when I went on my own. I, I felt like I needed the support of my partner and he wasn't ready, but I knew that I had to wait. I had to be patient, use God's grace and wait for him, just pray for him. But something was about to change. I was actually scanning and I saw the Hope Channel and on the Hope Channel I noticed they were doing a program on Daniel. At this time, my, my wife was still going to the other church on Sunday and um, she, she would keep harping on, you know, you need to come to church, you need to come to church. And so eventually he came and it was really exciting because he was there beside me. Um, and we sang and he liked the music and, um, but then he didn't come back. He said, I'm going to look for the proper church, the right church. I kept watching the Hope Channel and it sort of kept talking about the Sabbath. So I sort of started looking up the Sabbath and I questioned the pastor there. And uh, my wife used to get upset because she said, oh, you shouldn't be asking the pastor that. He knows more than you. Something in my heart, I wasn't right. And so I thought, well, I'll have to look for a church that honours the Sabbath. And the only one around here was the Seven Day Adventist. So that was the church that I decided that that must be the church that I need to go to. At the Kaitaia Adventist Church, Kevin met Pastor Patrick Coogan. I said, oh, what brought you along today, Kevin? And he said, um, because I wanted to find a church that kept the Sabbath, and I wanted to see what that church looked like. But Kevin, the man who initially didn't want to go to church at all, now had the challenge of convincing Anita to come with him to the Adventist church. Because when he told me he was going to the Seventh-day Adventist church, I said, oh, well, you go to your church and I'll go to mine. So I had to try and convince her that the Sabbath was important and it was written in the Bible that we should honour and keep it holy. And then she realised that, um, yes, it looks as though the Sabbath is important. And so she did come along to the Seventh-day Adventist church with me and support me. I started going to um, Seventh-day Adventist on Saturday and my other church on Sunday. I did that for about a month. That was so tiring that I thought, nah, I've got to give up the other church and just start coming to this one. Pastor Patrick began giving the couple Bible studies. When I was coming to the Seventh-day Adventist church, I was learning more through the Hope Channel and through Pastor Pat and then he, he did a session on baptism and I realised that um, to be truly committed in that, you need to be baptised as well. And we, me and my partner, we had been, we'd been going together for 43 years and um, we needed to, I decided that, you know, if we're going to honour God and keep his faith and that sort of thing, we need to get married first and then get baptised. When I said to her, you know, I explained to her really that we need to be a union, as in the Bible, that we need to get married. She was all for it straight away. They came up to me and said that they wanted to get married and they wanted to get baptised. 
course I was very pleased. And they said that um, they wanted to get um, married in their old church and baptised in this church. And I thought, good, we're on the better side of that one. <laughs> so uh, I acquiesced.
It was good to hear a little bit of Pigeon again. Papa got me, praise him you. Um, always good to hear. I'm going to go from PNG now across to Kempsey, just a couple of hundred kilometres up the road from us here in the studio. And I'm joined with Jimmy Dunn. Jimmy, great to see you and thank you for joining us on We Are The Church. Jimmy, you've got a, a, a really great story. You know, as we were chatting earlier, God has done something really special in your life. You were involved in drugs. You were a dealer. Um, you got involved with some uh, crime and I guess a, a little bit of a world that revolved around that. But God was doing something special in your life. Um, he used your wife to, I guess, really call you on some of this behavior. And then you went across and attended Mamarafa. Now, pick up the story from here. You went to Mamarafa. You learned to become a, a Bible worker. What happened from there? Well, I was doing Bible work in the AA in Kempsey as well. And then they, <clears throat> then you know, I was moving around. I was going around with, with Pastor Darren, showing his picture rolls, and we tell stories about about what's going on, what's, but what went on with Christ with the crucifixion. We had, had always show of creation. They love the story of Jesus, how he died on on, on the cross for for him, yeah, on, for us. So yeah, we we. We would have to enter the meeting, and they would come and, and ask us um, all questions. So we would point them to a, um, a Matthew 27, and, and that Christ died for us. You know, it's great to to to, to see the excitement in, in with, uh, with them. You know, so the they would see these old time, and and there'll be many at home that remember these picture scrolls from Sabbath school days. These were the scrolls; they had all sorts of pictures on them that that told the story of Jesus. And so these are the pictures that are being used right through the outback of you go in and you tell a story and then you show a big picture. And I've got some here in the, the studio that will bring back many memories for, for people. Um, now, these were given to us from, um, from ASI, but you can see through as I just flicked through some of them on, on health, um, on some of the great Bible stories that, that we've seen in the past. Um, Daniel chapter 2. So... People that you would meet, you'd tell them these sort of stories and they, all of a sudden they could visualise what you're actually reading to them as well. Yes, true. So what was some of the impacts, what was the impact of some of these picture scrolls on the people that you met? Did you have any stories you wanted to share? Yes, so there's, there's quite a few stories, but you know, like our mob is always shy and they will always sit up, up the back, you know, and the better. At the end of the meeting, they would get close and close at the meeting. They, they would ask questions about the, about the big statue of Daniel chapter 2. And then we'll, we'll explain them that you know, the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar conquered the world and <clears throat> the Medes of Persia and Greek and Rome. And, and we get down, down, down to the bottom where Christ we can smash it. And, you know, we just uh, hope in our eyes and they say, oh, well, we want to be, be, be ready when, when Jesus comes. Yeah, thank you, Jimmy. So these, these picture scrolls just really tell a story. And I know for, for different cultures, stories are significant parts. So for, for people to visualise, um, it just has such a, an impact for, for Christ, impacts for the kingdom when they see these, these pictures. Jimmy, it's a delight to have you on today. And thank you for your, your ministry. Thank you for continuing to, to serve God in taking these picture scrolls. I know Pastor Don's doing it, Pastor Darren's doing it, right around Australia, taking these to outback communities to in introduce people to this loving God that we, we have. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. From Kempsey, I want to take you now to the beautiful Fulton College. Each year we have a mission offering, and this year it is for the Fulton College to build a chapel for all the students around the Pacific that, that attend Fulton College. It's a wonderful opportunity for them to have a place of worship, for them to go and worship, for them to pray, for them to sing. And so we want to show you a clip now from Dr. Malcolm Coulson showing the great need to have a chapel there at Fulton College. My name is Malcolm Coulson, principal at Fulton Adventist University College. You will see that we have a lot of very good facilities. We have students who are really doing very, very well, but we have an incredible need, and we ask for your help and support with that need. I just want to share with you the fact that earlier this year, we asked our students, our staff, our community, and our alumni, what was the compelling reason 
why they supported and came to Fulton. They gave us four clear reasons why this is the place they have chosen. Firstly, is faith. They wanted an institution which would nurture and develop their spiritual side. The second thing that mattered to them was they wanted a place where they could experience and participate in acts of service. Thirdly, they wanted an institution where the learning experience would prepare them for the needs and for their future development. And lastly, they expressed their desire to fulfill a sense of calling. Comparing uh, life uh, outside Fulton to, to life in Fulton now, I faced really, really a lot of challenges. Sometimes I'm hungry, sometimes I don't eat for days. I just keep on praying. And when Pastor Fifita informed me about coming to Fulton, maybe this is a way of uh, of escaping this. They, they will be full there every time. They will, they will be, uh, accommodation will be very good. It's like an escape route for me. My life really, really changed a lot. Eh? Now that I baptized and I came to realize that it's not about doing what I like, it's doing what Jesus like. Life is more meaningful now. I chose Fulton because it is an institution that belongs to the church. Growing up as a child, I attended Seventh-day Adventist schools and this is the best place to be. Lecturers here are so helpful when it comes to questions and how to go about problems that we are facing in school. It has provided me a way that I can be closer to God and to trust His ways rather than mine. One key element is missing. What we lack is a chapel. The chapel would be the, the throbbing heart of this community. A place where students can come, the community can come, where visitors can come and sense what it means to be on a Seventh-day Adventist campus. A place that is holistic, a place that is about worship, a place that does care for the whole person. It's the one piece of the puzzle that is missing. And we can't do that without your help. This will give our students a chance to experience the holistic nature of Adventist education in one facility. We ask for you to give generously to this cause. So thank you for your support and your generous donation. We will be in touch with progress reports as this building takes shape and becomes the wonderful facility that we need on this campus. Thank you for your generosity to the chapel at Fulton. And so good to hear a song in my other language, Talk Pigeon. And to see Jimmy Dunn working in ministry after meeting you at Marmarafa College. Fantastic. We're now going to go to Tuvalu and uh, hear a testimony of what women are doing there in ministry. Now, Tuvalu is just a small little island and a lot of motorbikes. And the, the women are bikies as well, and they use them to reach people. You'll be blessed as you, you listen to that. When I come back, I'll share a little bit of news from around the division. There's a thing at the women ministry. There's a thing at the women ministry. あ、
Sare loa uki moa kwa tasu mpaa fine ui mani ministri. Ta yoko wa turo ki te mata loa, ka ela vea turo nei mātou, ka te pero te kuri ko tītī. I kona ko iro iei nei mātou, a Iesu e whakatasu mātou i roto i te alue ngā tēnā. Ia, awe mea te peipi ki ei, te oi whoki mai mātou, o te roto fia fia. Whai te mtau whakatai ki te alofa te atua, e iro nei mātou. O ia, ne whanoi mua. Ne oro whakatasi mātou mo Iesu i taim tēnā. Tēnā te awala, ne ma whaiei, o whakataunu mo te manuia, tēnā pukau mo tēnā ngā ruenga. Ia te akua konga, whakatua nāki kia Iesu, e ma uaiei te roto marosu, o whakataunu te ngā ruenga, ne tuku mai nei ia ke oro tātou o whai. Ia, Isa i ai fitu, tēnā whai tau e iwa, kā whai se tū mau tō whakatu anaki, a koe whoki se tū mau. It's very important for us to build a relationship with the local people because uh, we have seen, you know, the crime rate around our community has been uh, decreased by 20% over the last, you know, years of our ministries or around our community uh, by running the community service projects, uh, evangelistic programs, and uh, we also venture out into hospital ministry. Uh, we went into prison camps to run programs, Bible studies. And we have also conducted baptism in the prison over the years. And as a result, we have planted eight churches around PAU. When I was uh, in prison, the uh, uh, PAU staffs and students, they visited us and having uh, Bible studies with us. And that's where I was uh, converted. And after release from prison, and uh, I've become a faithful church member to this church, and they, uh, the PAU, uh, also sponsored me to do ministerial studies. So good to see the ministry happening out of Pacific Adventist University and staff and students uh, planting new churches because that's what we want to see all around our division. And I can say that we have a new vice chancellor at the Pacific Adventist University. We had our quinquennial SBD meetings and Professor Loi Matanaiho, the first Papua New Guinean, will start in that role in September. We also chose or nominated and now has been ratified by the General Conference a new secretary and a new CFO for our division. And it's my pleasure to introduce you to Pastor Mike Securi, the Secretary, and Mr. Francois Keat, the CFO. I'm going to enjoy working with them, and I'm sure they will serve our division really well. My name is Francois Keat, and I'm the newly appointed CFO of the South Pacific Division. I'm Australian by choice and was born in Somerset West, Cape Town area and migrated with my wife, Monique, and two boys at that stage to Australia in 2002. Australia was good to us and God added two beautiful girls to our family. Looking back, I can clearly see how God has led me to this role through various acquaintances, experiences, cultures and roles inside and outside the church and have no doubt that this is God's leading for my life. I firmly believe we are living in the toenails of the statue of Daniel 2. Therefore, as a church leader, I have a strong sense of mission and urgency. And it is critical for me to ensure that our financial resources are aligned to our key strategic objective of making more disciples through mission to the cities, media ministries, health ministries, and getting them ready to take the final warning of the soon return of Jesus to the world. Please pray for me for God's wisdom and understanding. Greetings. My name is Pastor Mike Sikuri, and currently my family and I, we are based in South New Zealand. Originally, though, we are from the beautiful island of Rutuma in Fiji and with links to Tuvalu. 
I really love this concept of we are the church, reminding us of the rich meaning that the church is not a building, but it's the people, it's you and I. Today, though, I would just like to share with us another biblical picture that we see, the image of the body of Christ, reminding us that in that one body, there are many equal parts. And uh, when they all are pulling together, bringing their richness of diversity and uh, specialty to the body of Christ, glorifying God, he, who is the head of the church, his last day movement flourishes. Last week, for the first time, I attended our executive meetings for the division and listened to the amazing stories of what God is doing in our area. I came away enthused, encouraged, excited. Did you know that in our four different unions, we have many different conferences and missions. We have over 14,000 employees. We have over 6,235 churches and companies. We have over 420 schools and institutions. But the best part I love about it is that Team South Pacific, there's over 609,000 of us and growing. And yes, God's blessed all of these folk to be part of this one body of Christ, unique doing our own things, using the gifts that He's blessed us with, but reminding us that we are one. And uh, my prayer is that as we continue to serve the Lord in our various territories, that God will continue to bless us as we pull together as the South Pacific family, as Team South Pacific, each working in our unique uh, context and areas within our circles of influence for Jesus, but keeping in mind that we are one. And you know, one of these days when God comes to take us home and He bursts through the clouds with His angels, may each of us be found to be good and faithful servants of God. God bless you all. Thanks, uh, Francois and Mike. So earlier today, we learnt from Pastor Matthew Walter that the Apostle Paul called Titus a true son in our common faith. How was he a true son? Well, Paul trusted him and left him to go it alone in Crete, where there was an expanding disciple-making movement. Paul trusted him to organise churches and to appoint leaders. He trusted him to deal with heresy, error and conspiracy theories. He trusted him to teach sound doctrine, which was practical and focused on good family and community relationships. Titus was trusted as a true son in the common faith as he was going about God's business. He knew who he was in Jesus. Let me read Titus 3, 3 to 7. Once we too were foolish and disobedient. We were misled and became slaves to many lusts and pleasures. Our lives were full of evil and envy. We hated each other. But when God, our Saviour, revealed his kindness and love, he saved us not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Because of his grace, he made us right in his sight and gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. Titus knew that Jesus had changed him. He knew that all that he was doing and had done would never bring him joy and identity to be known as a son of the king of the universe. But all of that came through the mercy and gift of Jesus. Jesus had changed him and given Titus real identity. He was a true son in the shared faith. And in Titus chapter 2, uh, in verses 11 to 14, it also talks about this. 
For the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. And we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures. We should live instead in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness and devotion to God while we look forward with hope to that wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, will be revealed. He gave his life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us and to make us his very own people, totally committed to doing good deeds. Not only Titus, but you and I can be true sons and daughters in the faith because in this faith we know our identity comes from the changed life that we have in Jesus and that we are trusted members of God's family going about his business until we reach the heavenly home and our true inheritance. When we know who we are in Jesus, we're a true son and daughter, and it's easy for us to go. We're about to wrap up, but before we do, Wayne Bohm has got something special for us tomorrow. Thanks, Glenn. Tomorrow, two o'clock Sydney time, we'll be doing a special workshop on how to share your faith. So we'll be on AdventistChurch.com and also the social media platforms for Adventist Media on uh, YouTube and Facebook. Just search us up on Adventist Media and join us live for this workshop on If You Can Eat, You Can Make Disciples. Look forward to seeing you at two o'clock. Thanks, Wayne. I think uh, tomorrow afternoon will be really worthwhile because as true sons and daughters of God, and knowing our identity, we will want to share that with other people in real and natural ways. And I know Pastor Lloyd Grolleman and uh, Dr. Peter Roanfelt will have some really good practical tips for that. We're going to wrap up with uh, a, a song, but before we go to that beautiful music, let me pray for us. Our God in heaven, we just say thank you for what you're doing in our lives that through Jesus Christ, we know who we are, true sons and daughters of the faith, and that enables us to go about your business. May you empower us to do that and bless us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God is so, so good, and he helps us learn how to be like him. And He cares for us, and He guides us by His Holy Spirit. When you think of how He answers prayer, you see Almighty Alpha and Omega, Omega. And he is shining brighter than the light. He cares. He is kind and true, I want to be like you. He will be my guide, when I fall I'll rise by His Spirit. Hear the nature around us speak, His almighty hand written all over.
He's watching over me. I don't wanna make promises I'll break. Not to Jesus. He's my God and He's my Savior. He's the only Alpha and Omega. Omega. And he is shining bright. How to be like you?